One of the biggest revelations of my life has been that everything is connected. Our education system does not do a good job of teaching, point number one though. It takes us through a system and it doesn't empower us to be the drivers of our learning. And humans like personalized experiences, so why isn't learning personalized? So some things about me is I grew up with a love for art, invention, and entrepreneurship. I was interested in many things, and I went to school and created experiences for kids in my mom's daycare. So here's a picture of me. I'm the one dressed like a clown. I would put on experiences for the kids of my mom's daycare. I learned how to create balloon animals. I also created a real world Super Mario Brothers in our basement by reorganizing some benches and we'd hop from bench to bench or creating an economy by creating our own money and checks and having stores all in our basement. And that was a lot of fun as I was growing up. But when it was time to go to college, I was told, get a degree that you can use, an engineering degree. There was only one problem. I didn't know what an engineer was. <laughs> they didn't teach it in school. So when my mom said get an engineering degree, it was like, huh, um, you want me to do something, but I don't know what it is. But I'll try to, you know, learn. So I did. I went, I got an engineering degree. It was hard. We did integrals, system dynamics, math, vibrations, electronics, and it was all interesting and very theoretical, but it wasn't until my third year in college that I took fluid dynamics, and I was like, oh, integrals are related to fluids, and there was an issue because all of this was disconnected. You're learning these equations, and you don't know why you're learning these equations, even though these equations were derived from something physical. But if they had just connected it, it would have made sense. So it was my third year of engineering school, and I was like, oh, there was a reason why they taught it. But why didn't they just tell it up front that there's actually a real world connection to all of this theory? Because all of the theory is derived from something real. But the reason why I became a mechanical engineer was because I really wanted to make stuff. And so these are some projects that I created. This was a piggy bank. Uh, we, I had to 3D model it, first time I ever got to use a 3D printer back in around 2005. We created a running assistive device, we created a lean steering vehicle, we prototyped it in Lego, and then we actually got to build it and I got to weld and use the machine shop, and I loved it. And so I was like, yes, mechanical engineering is for me because I finally get to make stuff. But then I started in the real world. And I started in a corporate America company. Most of it was sitting in a queue, doing paperwork, just converting from one unit to another, and just looking up codes for pressure vessels. And this was so different than what I was excited about when I was in school. And I realized that my passions had branched off from the work that I was doing. This resulted of me sitting at my desk and looking at the clock and waiting for those nine hours to pass by so I could finally go home. This was very unsatisfying. I was so far from what I wanted to be doing that when I went home, I had to use my creativity and so I would paint. So I realized there was a very stark divergence of what I was interested in and what I was passionate about. So what I really wanted to happen was I wanted these paths to merge, but how? With work, that's what pays the bills. That's how you survive, that's how you make a living. You need to work to get paid. Your passions can make you happy. So then the question became, how can I sustain myself and be happy? So first I had to define the problem. I was unhappy, but why? I was told at work, you ask too many questions. We don't change something unless it's broken. And I would get, you're different. At work, this was our cafeteria. And there was a bunch of round tables, and the thing was, was we had grades at work, grade levels, and it wasn't culturally acceptable to talk to someone really above you or below you or in a different organization because they look at you like, why are you talking to me? If you didn't already schedule to have lunch with somebody, you would go and get your lunch and go up to your desk and start eating. Very isolated experience. So being new, I was like, well, this is weird for me. I kind of imagine something different. So I had an idea. The idea was to have a painted table in the middle of the cafeteria with zany colors, and just sitting there meant you were open to having conversation. <laughs> so here was my vision. People from 
different organizations come in and talking to each other. Crazy thought right there. So I did it. I spearheaded a team called the Mixer Table Team. And very not culturally uh, what was there, people took the paints on their hands and they put it on the table and it became the Mixer Table and they're still in the middle of the cafeteria. I took some personal development classes and we had to take a innovation test and we had to take the Myers-Briggs, which is a personality test. And then they graphed all of us on the graph. So here was about a normal distribution of where the majority of the company was. They flipped through the paper. So normally we get this, but this class we had one outlier. <laughs> Sharon, do you ever feel out of place? People say you're different. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, now I had a word to describe it. These people like to do things better, and people over there like to do things differently. And while the majority of the company was an ISTJ, introverted, sensing, thinking, judging, I was a complete opposite, an ENFP, extroverted, intuitive, feeling, perceiving. Well, now I finally had language to explain to people why I was different, and now I could understand why they were different. So now I had to begin my journey to research to find a solution. So I started reading The Art of Innovation because the person who was doing the professional development recommended this book to me. I said, you know I'm different. What do you recommend? He's like, read this book, The Art of Innovation. I read it and I was like, that's how I think. And there are other people who think like me, so it must not be that crazy. And so I went to the library and I started getting other books that were related. And I started looking at the front cover of the book and I'm like, these books really resonate with me. And I read The Open Jacket and they're all in Palo Alto, California. <laughs> now, I didn't really know what Silicon Valley was. It was something that they would say on the TV. I had never been more west than Chicago because I went to Purdue. <laughs> so I realized I had to make a change. So then there was a couple things that I was realizing. Now, from kindergarten to sixth grade, you go through each. From kindergarten, you know you're going into first grade. From first, you know you're going to second. From elementary school, you know you're going to middle school. From middle school, before you get there, you know you're going into high school. Before you take your next step, you know you're going to college. And usually, before you graduate, you have a job. There's a flow. And then you become a nice little cog. <laughs> and hopefully a working machine. So, but then I needed to make a change, and I realized I was over here, but I really wanted to get to California, where you can just let your crazy hang out. <laughs> a little bit about my journey. Before, I knew what job I was going to take, and now I wanted to take a different approach, because I wanted a different result. So the approach that I took this time was I'm going to move to California without having a plan. Okay, now this was in the heart of the recession and my parents were asking if I was crazy, but when you're genuinely unhappy, then it's easier to make a change. So I had a new plan. My plan was to go to the place that I thought was right for me and do all of these different things. So I was teaching tennis, I had a photography company, I got involved at the Stanford Design School, I started a blog, I took some classes, some continuing education classes, I wrote a business plan, I was a youth group advisor, I was even at a startup trying to embed projectors and cell phones, and all of these things were things I enjoyed. But the question was, was which one of these would make money? Because I needed both. So some of them made some money, and then an opportunity came up where I got involved in the design school of Stanford because this was the heart of what of these people who thought like me. And someone was looking for someone technical, good with kids. There was an opportunity that went on. So I replied, I said, hey, I'm good with kids. I have an engineering degree. And I started teaching that once a week after school program turned into becoming the director of education and then the director of the whole thing. And I started my career in educational robotics. Willow Garage, I had the CEO say, hey, I have $14 million of robots sitting here on weekends. Can we do something interesting and get it out to kids? And then when I worked at WizBots, I taught some kids, and one of the parents came up to me and said, hey, my kids go to Woodland School. We're looking for a technology teacher. Would you be interested? 
So I started teaching there for four years. And meanwhile, I was doing Techie Kids and using my classroom as a lab to create a technology program that was scalable because I realized that was an issue when I was working at Ms. Botts. And so now I'm doing Techie Kids full time. So here's a little bit, some pictures from WizBots. I had opened a center in Belmont. So you can see that I was teaching with the Lego Mindstorm and teaching kids coding and programming. This is a $400,000 robot created by Willow Garage. This is called the PR2. I would bring it to the Tech Museum and I had an exhibit there teaching kids to program. It was really cool. We had kids from 2 to 99 coming to program this robot. They were teaching at the Macarena in Gangnam style. <laughs> and then at Woodland School, I crafted a technology program for kindergarten through eighth grade, teaching kids robotics and programming and electronics and all the really cool stuff that I loved in engineering, incorporating it into the curriculum. So we have teaching, engineering, technology, design, creativity, and kids. All of these things I'm interested in. Raise your hand if you're interested in at least one of these things. Okay. I see a bunch of hands. And luckily I found out that pretty much everyone is interested in at least one of these things. So let's rearrange those. So now we have engineering and technology, teaching kids, and creativity and design. So if we combine those, we have teaching engineering, teaching creativity and design and thinking, and product design. And if you sum up all of this, you get techie kids. I summed up everything I was interested in because I saw that if you have something that people can relate with, then they get interested as well. Techie Kids is a way for kids to be able to learn, build amazing projects, get inspired, and find their passions. It's a platform to connect learners, maker tools, schools, and teachers in an organized system that helps scaffold the original project creation process. Multiple maker tech tools and concepts are seamlessly integrated in a project-based way, taught with the Techie Kid system, including Robotics with the Thymia Robot, the Internet of Things with Acer's Cloud Professor and Arduino, User Interaction Design with Scratch and the Makey Makey, 3D Modeling with Tinkercad, and much, much more. Now different tools can be taught in the same classroom at the same time. The content is delivered on Techie Kids, allowing personalized learning paths and learners to go at their own pace. Now non-technical teachers can start getting comfortable with integrating technology into their lessons. A teacher's dashboard allows the tracking of a group's progress. Teachers can also use Techie Kids to learn and explore the content firsthand as well, making it easier to bring the newest and most exciting technology into their classrooms in a meaningful way to create extraordinary creations and inventions that make the world a little bit better. This is pretty much the Techie Kids Design Thinking Machine. You take in a problem and you get out a solution. But the great thing about doing all of this is it can be used in the real world too. So if you do this stuff in the classroom, then when it comes to real life, you can apply these critical thinking skills. So as an example, problem, I was unhappy with my job. To understand, I had to ask questions, and I took those personality tests. Provocation is basically when you have to take a large leap, because if you do something crazy, you can get something to more innovative than if you had just took, taken the next step. But you can do something totally crazy, and then you can take a step back. I moved out to California. And brainstorm was all of those opportunities that I took advantage of. Then I converged towards a solution where I started getting involved in robotics education. I had an idea to implement, which was to techie kids, and then you have to test, iterate, test, iterate, which I would do in my classroom as I made it, and then I would observe people using it, and so forth, to come up with a final product to share it out, and that's the solution. So you can take that methodology, and you can apply it in the classroom by having kids work on projects that they care about with purpose. So here's our current system, except let me add a little bit something. The education system is also broken down into subjects. So we have physical education, we have art, music, social studies, English, and let's say you take some math and you decide to go farther with it, you end up narrowing your focus to doing, picking a major in college. And when you do a job, you're usually doing an even smaller part of that if you're at a large company. Okay, let's show you something that's closer to reality. Let's look at everyone's path. 
So here we have the different subjects across time from kindergarten through your job. But the reality is, these are the options available to you. The thing is, is in school you're taught so much. But in college there's a lot more majors that you have no exposure to. So there's no path to get from here to here because the education system has been around for so long. But colleges are usually there to fill a need. So colleges are the next thing to start offering programs that are available for jobs. But the thing is, is the variety of jobs is even bigger than what they teach in school. But there's no path to get there, which leads into this gap of there are jobs like in STEM and engineering that are currently there and there's new opportunities opening up all the time, but our education system currently is pretty stagnant and they're not taking advantage of that opportunity. And most people will do majors of things that they're comfortable with, things they've done before. And so the pipeline to get to these virtual reality, robotics, unfortunately isn't there right now. Oh yeah. Closer to reality, there's life. And in life, everything is connected. It's not broken out into subject matter and category. When was the last time I said, I'm about to give you a geometry question. Why don't we solve this? No, life is a lot more involved. A lot more things coming at you, and you have to do it all. Because things are actually connected. But in school, they didn't create that program because it's better for the student. They created that program because it's just manageable to pass on a kid from grade to grade, to break it down into subject matter. But it's not really the ideal way to teach somebody. So let's imagine a better way. So this is what I imagine. I imagine in the center there being a purpose. And you do that purpose in kindergarten. You do a small project. And then through the years, you do a more complex project and a more complex project doing the process over and over again, but getting experts in different areas. So K through six might look something like that. K through eight, you expand. K through 12, so what happens when people then do the career paths, it launches out, except without creating that big gap that was there before. And if you can personalize learning, people can then take their own paths. They can take their own paths and do it along their way, combine their passions with what they're learning, and then become subject matter experts. So this can be the future of learning, where kids collaborating, working together, and creating projects and talking to one another. Or this can be the future of learning, either unchanged or looking at a computer screen, listening to something and not engaging. It's up to you. Will you be an active participator creating your path and driving your future? Or will you be passively engaging and be a passenger in your journey? Will your path be, I have my work and I have my passion and they're separate? Or will you find a way to combine them? So some things to remember. Take control of your learning and paths. There's lots of resources where you can do your own learning. And take your passions and combine them. Find ways to connect your passions to your work. And lastly is a little equation I came up with. Creativity plus skill plus a positive attitude is equal to success. Thank you.